Hi there, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Cloud Based Mayhem. Got a great show for you today with Till Galbraith. He's been involved in sports since the very, very beginning, in the mid 80s, and uh, has been working with Nova now for many years now on the PR side of things so it's really really interesting to get his take on how they developed the Nova team and why they put all those incredible pilots on the mentor a few years back and just kind of blew everybody's minds because these guys you know were sending these huge FAI triangles in the Alps and it really made everybody rethink you know what aspect wing you need to fly to go big and so we talk a lot about that we talk about Nova's, um, you know, the the kind of the the general thinking has been that companies like Gen and Niviac and and Ozone, by creating open class gliders and really pushing the limits of what a glider can do, and now the CCC gliders, that that technology gets passed down through the brand and makes the C's and the B's and the A's even better. And Nova has really proved that that's maybe not the case. So uh, really interesting talk about glider design and safety and risk and flying lower end gliders flying them really well uh you know kind of the mental capacity that they take a lot less so you can fly them maybe longer so some really interesting things to 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 think about uh in your own personal flying depending on where you are and how many hours and as you all know i'm a big fan of the two liners but uh this really made me think so pretty interesting stuff uh, a little bit of housekeeping. You may remember from the last show, we've got these really cool signs that Josh Heater makes uh, down in Utah that, you know, paraglider needs to ride a car. Super, super lightweight, made out of great fabric. Uh, you can just pop them out and sit on the side of the road and up your chances to get a ride rather than sticking your thumb out. Not such a big deal for those of you in Europe where you have uh, all kinds of infrastructure and transit and stuff, but over here in the wild, wild west, we often spend a lot of time hitchhiking, so uh, really cool signs. You can circumnavigate, circumvent, I guess is the better word, uh, getting them by just going to his website. Those links to buy those, I think they're like 17 bucks, are on the uh, in the show notes for this show and for the last one, Adele Hante. So you can go to those, but also if you want to just, if you can share the show on Instagram, Facebook, whatever, tag Cloud Base Mayhem, I will see it and I'll put you in a, in a, batch with the hat and uh and i'll draw one out of there and send you a sign so we've got a few of those to give away so uh cool way to support the show is just sharing it with your friends letting other people know about it trying to spread the knowledge so without uh further delay please enjoy this really cool conversation with till galbraith this took us months to put together but it was well worth it enjoy Till, so great to have you on the show. We've been working at this for months, man. I'm sorry it's taken so long to uh, to make this happen, but you know, all good things with time. So I'm really excited to talk to you and and hear about what you've been doing with Nova all these years and uh, the Nova team. But uh, before we started recording, there you you said you got into paragliding a little bit differently than most, just because of the, it didn't actually exist when you got into paragliding. Let's let's start off with that. Let's let's introduce yourself to the audience via your your history. Yeah, well, actually, it did exist, of course, because I was not the, the one who invented it. Um, but at that time, I was I was dreaming and fantasizing of of a career of becoming a famous mountaineer. And one one thing to achieve it was uh, I worked in a um, well mountaineering store in Munich, and um, when we, we we saw in in the mags cut from the first photographs of paragliding, which was obviously coming from France, French are ahead in that case. Um, we looked at it and said, "Damn, that would be cool to do some kind of climbing and then just be up there, have a fantastic launch site, and then fly down, and you don't have to walk down." That was so fascinating. So when we started, it was not actually that we were planning to fly. We just want to get rid of getting down, yeah, uh, walking sure. down, and just get down somehow. The other guy there I started with was um, Carl Slezak, who has become the safety guru at DHV. And um, so what we did is we, we went to our boss and said, hey, you know, Peter, that's paragliding stuff. That's so cool. And it will be, it will be great. And, you know, we are a great shop, so we should we should – we should be ahead of the pack and do something on it. And he said, yes. And we also answered, uh, we asked him all kinds of questions that he would have to answer with yes, eventually asking, so what about <laughs> you buy two wings and we take care how it works? And he said, yes. 
So, <laughs> <laughs> and it's true. <laughs> he, he was he was actually he was. It sounds negative, but he was reasonably easy to man- manipulate. Ah, if you, perfect. It, if you that's put him you in a yes saying mood, he would he would say yes, and that's exactly what we did. So eventually, it was in um, summer of eighty six, I think. There were two wings, and we had absolutely no clue of how how to to operate them. There was no no license in Germany yet, no paragliding school, no nothing. But there was already that that video from what was his name from Verbier, um, Supermax. Do you remember? Yeah, of course. The, the super, it's a it, Supermax video you find on 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 YouTube. So that was actually our instruction manual because I mean we were smart enough to start from the very beginning just spreading it out and somewhere where it was absolutely dead flat that we would wouldn't be <laughs> wouldn't, run. wouldn't start flying just just run and and then where how how does they how do they inflate this thing i think they they're pulling the front ones <laughs> and it was really watching the video and then taking wing and then go out on a, on a green field and, and see how it works I love and that's, it. that's that's how we started. It was was years like like I think in eighty no eighty eight I think I went to a paragliding school in Austria because because by then there was a license and obviously you had to have a license to compete and stuff like that. And then um, it was still the like like the, the boom times of paragliding, and and the instructor said, "Oh, I can see you've done it before, so maybe you can assist a little bit because I'm actually a hang gliding teacher and I've done just ten flights." <laughs> and by that time we. <laughs> We had already done illegal like fifty flights or something like that, so um, it was it was wild. <laughs> one of my one of my flying partners here, Nate Scales, said that when he uh, he had a guy come into the ski shop that he was working in and said, "Hey, does anybody want to learn how to paraglide?" and and Nate didn't know what it, he'd never heard of it or seen it. it went, yeah, I want to learn how to paraglide. And the guy took him out to a hill and, and he, he lobbed him off the hill. And then Nate landed and the guy said, okay, now you know everything I know. <laughs> that was that was his instructor, you know, one flight. Okay, well, that's it. <laughs> when was that? Oh, it was like 87. It's about the same time what you're talking about. 87, okay, 88, yeah. you know, just yeah. right, in the, right in the beginning. I just, you guys are such pioneers. I love it. I love the stories from back then. Well, then, so, so you, uh, you know, so you get into it, you start learning how to fly these kind of three to one gliders, I'm sure, pretty much parachutes. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, today, today, uh, just the Rogallo Reserve has a better <laughs> LD than the, the wings we were flying at that time. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And I mean, the funny thing was, like, we were we were absolutely aware that it is a potentially dangerous thing, and um, so we, we really took it step by step. I mean, first flat, then then a gentle training slope, and then finally we walked up on on mountains that we were hoping would end in some kind of a launchable um, spot. Hmm. But we had to find out that nice climbing mountains typically do not end with grassy slopes that uh, that are uh, directed towards the wind yeah sure um, it, it was it was a nightmare and also like knowing that the the performance of the wings was so bad we were i mean the most important instrument we had was that that ld meter yeah so you, you could see i know and it was like, oh no i think this mountain is not steep enough let's better walk <laughs> down <laughs> so i think the first first three or four years was basically carrying up the stuff and then walking down again without climbing and without flying. <laughs> <laughs> so none of the advantages you were shooting for, you weren't getting the climbing and you weren't getting the descent tool. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So that, that's how it all started, but I'm still doing it. I still like it so much and I've never stopped and I've never had an accident. I actually not, not even hurt myself. Touch really? Wood. Yeah. Touch wood there. So, so well, give, give us a, uh, Give us the CV side of your of your flying career. I mean, that's almost forty years. It, am I got that right? Yeah, well, thirty. Yeah, 30, yeah. 35. thirty five. Um, thirty something. Yeah. Yeah. So, did you did you eventually get into comps, or you know, what was the trajectory? Yeah, I mean, what what happened is that particularly in the beginning is that the the performance of the wings was just, I mean, the steps forward were were just amazing, but but still, I mean. Improving from one to three to one to five is almost doubling, but but still it was only one to five. Yeah. Um, but I remember the the first German Championships in eighty eighty seven. Um, luckily, uh, funnily, there were two because DHV and the Aero Club both said, "It's it's my sports. We want to uh-huh. have paragliding." 
<laughs> so there were two German, cha- two official German championships, and at that time there was there were some people like like Tony Bender. I mean, he 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 was he was always there, and, and he was always flying, and he had a, a long career as a as a hang gliding pilot. He knew what thermal flying is. I mean, we had no no idea of anything. Mm. I mean, we, we we just we would walk up somewhere where we would hope it's launchable, and then find out went from the wrong way and and had no clue. And these guys, they, they, these guys, they knew how to thermal. And I remember it was already in '87 that that at one of the training runs, somebody was flying half an hour. And I mean, all my flights had been less than five minutes, no matter how, how <laughs> high were, we went. You were worse than speed flying. <laughs> it was close to speed. It, it was a mix of speed flying, but just slowly. <laughs> right, right. Just plummeting I mean, out of the sky slowly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, like like close close to the ground uh following the contours and but but i mean having no idea of anything and then i mean it's i I thought half an hour it was just unbelievable and then i mean i saw somebody climbing up and to me it was like what are they doing there um but still it took me i don't know i think i'm not very talented (laughs) um it took me years to actually be able to stay in the air and at that time, it was, I mean, you were cool when you had, I mean, first of all, you had to have neon clothes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> look, looking at these old photographs, oh, my, wife, awesome. <laughs> my wife, when she, when, when she saw these photographs, she said, if I had seen them before, I would have never married you. That's so <laughs> embarrassing. <laughs> It's like, you know what it's like is like uh, looking at the pictures of my dad when he was a golfer back then, you know, like in the seventies and early eighties, you know, just the funniest bell bottom pants. And I mean, the stuff they wore is hysterical, but yeah, it's even worse with the paragliding. Yeah. I mean, it had to be neon bright to be cool. Yeah. So, um, there was the neon, neon, um, times and then, um, eventually, yeah, I mean, at that time. You were cool if you had neon clothes. You were cool when you did many flights, and you were cool if you did long flights. I mean, mm. not long distance, but just staying in the air. Stay in the air. And I, re- yeah. I remember it was maybe in my fourth year or fifth year. Um, I was at, at Wallberg. Um, it's 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 a wall, the Wall Mountain, <laughs> if you translate directly. Um, it's um, near directly close to a lake, and with a northwesterly wind. Um, you have a breeze coming over that lake and then a very gentle soaring conditions. And, and that was, I remember my first flight, I had, to, you had to do six hours to be cool and I wanted to be super cool. So I was cruising there without any idea how to thermal, just going back and forth on that same slope for six hours, actually had to pee in my Gore-Tex pants because, uh, <laughs> I'd never done such a long flight, and I didn't <laughs> didn't take that into my considerations of of things I should do before I launch. And when I mean, when you've done five hours, you you want to have these six hours. I had to pee my pants, no question. <laughs> <laughs> so then, then I I became cool. Um, <laughs> Once you pee in your pants, you're cool. <laughs> yes, 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 definitely. And then um, eventually, I, I I understood more how how thermal flying works. But again, like the more talented people were, they were already go- going cross country. And to me, that it just didn't pop up into my mind. And and also, like you heard it, but you didn't see it. And then there was no online contest. It was it was just basically people who launched with you, and then they were gone. And 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 sometimes having a beer, people would say, "Did you hear? He's he has flown twenty kilometers, and like twenty kilometers it was just an unbelievable distance." Yeah, yeah and it's, um, it's funny when you so, get into it too. When when I was first introduced to the sport, it was at Tiger Mountain, just outside of Seattle, and. You know, a buddy of mine lived right at the LZ and and he would go up and fly all the time. And so I would go over and I'd look up in the sky and I'd see all these people kind of bobbing around. It looked incredibly boring to me, just kind of slowly bottling around. And uh, I, when I first got into it was 10 years after that, I still didn't understand that people could go anywhere. I, I had just seen people fly around and then you land in the LZ and you have a beer. I didn't understand that you could actually take them to travel. You know? exactly, and th- yeah, and this yeah. was in the early 2000s. You know, I was just clueless. Yeah. But then, I mean, if, it, if uh, especially at Nova, we have the, in the Nova pilots team, we have the, the juniors. And what I see now is, or since let's say since 10 years, it's the the second generation of paragliders. It's it's children who grow mm. up in a paragliding household, 
and um and and i mean since they 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 started to walk it it was obvious to them that something happening there and and then they they start at like launching flying with eight or nine mm. illegally and yeah, yeah. just seeing how they how they ground handle and 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 how talented they are i mean we've we've in, in the pilots team we have met people in their first year they, they did 200 kilometer triangle in the first legal year, let's say. Yeah. You know, at the at the start of the X Alps this year, it was so rainy and terrible. And Kriegel and I were kind of hiding in this little tent that they had for us. And he was showing me videos of his kids, you know, a six-year-old. I, I think the old one's nine or something. Can you imagine? I mean, Kriegel's kids? It's going to be fascinating watching what happens in the next 20 years with these these kids that are, you know, coming into it. I mean, I didn't discover paragliding until I was in my late 30s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. De- oh, definitely, it, it will be. I mean, if if you look at sports climbing, for example, it's it's they are they are a couple of years ahead, mm. and and there if, if you, you see these young guys like 13, 40 years old, and they 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 climb climb nine C. Yeah, it's un- just unbelievable. Yeah, it's just superhuman, almost, isn't it? It's just it's, yeah. it's hard to even fathom. Well, that's a good that's a good transition because I know that you were. Um, you know, f- first describe describe your role at at Nova, and then I want to get into the Nova team. Okay. Uh, well, after these these early years, I, I did a bit of comp flying, um, but but I had to realize I'm I'm not really good at it. Um, but it was more also like a social thing. Of I mean, in, in the beginning, we were we were so little who did it that you were happy to meet just anybody and have a chat with them. Mm. And um, so I I always kept on flying some years more intensively, some years less intensively. And um, concerning my my business career, I, I was I was chief editor of um, Outdoor magazine in Germany, um, mm. similar to Outside in the US sure. or or well, closer to Backpacker, I would say. My 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 passion for traveling and the, the great outdoors and also taking photographs led into becoming the chief editor of a non-existent magazine. I was the chief editor because it was the only one. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, it was it was the early days. <laughs> and um from after that i was i was traveling for almost seven years also trying to get to, uh doing living as a freelance writer and photographer trying to get to the most remote place in the world like sailing to antarctica and i've been on pitcairn island where the people the descendants from the mutiny on the bounty live and walked across the ice cap in greenland and spent 50 days on the patagonian ice cap so and it was wow. always somehow related with outdoor stuff and during that time um, I was asked whether I would would like to work as a consultant or in communication for companies from the outdoor industry, which eventually led in '99 that I founded a communications agency together with a business partner, and we only do sports and outdoor at the moment, like working for Arcteryx or Gregory Eagle Creek GSI, Kraft, and companies like that. And mm-hmm. since I was I was um, always flying um, without. I mean, I was writing stories at that time for um, German-speaking magazines, but I had no no plans of of being deeper involved in that business. And it was a coincidence that the the German representative for Nova had the feeling that Nova was not really too good at doing communications and PR, and he introduced me to Wolfie. Funnily, I have never been flying in Nova Wing, even though I, I knew the people all the time. But I had in the, in the beginning, I had an elder car like everybody, mm. and they were they were so dominant. And then various other wings, and it was I think it was 15 years ago that um, Robert Kleinhans introduced me to Wolfie, the CEO of Nova. And um, Wolfie in the beginning was very reluctant because he thought that all these agency people they just rip you off and mm. do a lot of lot of talking, but but never work. Mm. As I needed a new wing, the, the, the initial deal was I, I get a new wing. I think it was a Carbon at that time. It was also the time, yeah, Carbon was for me, it was, was the first time then I stepped back from, from higher class wing to, at that time, a 1 to 2, or today, ENB wing. Mm-hmm. And because I had been caught by cross-country flying and um, and and like being not that talented pilot, I realized at that time that if I let me compare it with a, with a car, you have a certain amount of fuel in the tank, and once the tank is empty, you're done. And and like my ability to concentrate and to focus on on flying, I found out I, if I fly a higher class wing, 
I spent fuel on having my wing under control mm. and eventually make a wrong decision and then bump out. And and flying an E and B wing or one to two at that time, that was in balance. I I could do this for eight, nine, or ten hours. And because um what it required from from my side on attention was was something I was able to deliver that whole time. And if you if you want to fly long, first of all you have to try to prevent to land. If you stay in the air for a long time, eventually you you will go rather far. And and that was for me like like um yeah, like like a key to to fly much longer than mm. um, previously, and that was also the time when when Nova contacted me. So I asked them for a carbon, and it, as an exchange for writing some text and stuff. And when it came to a point when where I thought, well, now I've worked enough, now I should get money for it. Um, it was Wolfie who contacted me and said, "Hey, Till, I have to tell you something. I was pretty negative about agencies and guys like you, but." Um, I think it can work, and that's that's how it all started. And in the beginning, I was only I, I'm still working as a freelancer for Nova, running my own PR agency or to, together with my business partner. Um, but the involvement with Nova has become pretty deep. So we're still doing public relations, but I was also then mainly responsible to have the idea with the Nova Pilots team and. And and I'm also like a, like a part of the team, like the general positioning of the brand and and what what we are doing. Um, it's it's they they willingly accept my suggestions. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But um, it's not so bad actually. So uh, yeah, and that's that's why that's where I want to talk about the the Nova pilot team. The the you know I you'll have to correct my time frame here, but you know about four or five years ago, uh, maybe four. Um, yeah, I was in Spike Bowden with Bruce and, you know, we were just flying. This was before we were kind of thinking too seriously about the X Alps and stuff. And there was this sudden just mentor, you know, Bernie Pessy and these guys that were just sending these massive triangles on the mentor. And, uh, and it, it was just, it, it, it started blowing everybody away. It was, it was really the talk of the paragliding community. Well, it still is in, in a sense, you know, the, these guys are just, the first to put up the 300 FAI and um, just these huge lines um, on a lower end wing. And, uh, and it really just kind of reoriented how everybody thought about uh, exactly what you were just saying, you know, having more energy in the tank and, you know, Nova's approach, I, I can't say is, is totally u- unique. I mean, there are other, there are other manufacturers out there that also don't mess with the CCC wings and, you know, the open class wings, but um, you know, they have carved out a position there that has been really fruitful for them. And I, and I think a lot of that, maybe, I don't know if that started before, uh, the, the Nova team, but I'd, I'd love for you to talk about that and the vision and, and how that played out. It's all connected somehow. If, if you look at Nova in, 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 in the old days, I think there were years, and I, I don't know which model it was because at that time I wasn't I was not interested in comps anymore, and, and, I, and I and I don't know which were the top wings, but I know for sure that there was a year when Nova was was so dominating in the paragliding World Cup that all other manufacturers together collected less points than just Nova. Mm. Um, so I think it was was it the Xeon? Well, I, I don't know. People might correct me for that, but but Nova was was extremely strong. But but what happened then is that the the comp flying became so yeah moved away so far from 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 the average pilot that people were just not so interested in it anymore mm-hmm. and at the same time this this cross country flying uh, happened and there were lot, lots of people who said well like like myself as a comp pilot I'm 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 not not I I hate to go to places which are Horrible flying. I mean, sometimes you have to, to fly flu- through a lee, but um, with comps, you often have to go to places which are not so comfortable because that's just just the the task. And mm-hmm. and if, if if I decide where I go, I can I can p- possibly fly around something. And so I like that cross country thing a lot. And and then it was also the time when when the Leonardo started, and and shortly after that, uh, online online contest org, and then Leonardo, and then then the X contest, and suddenly 
you didn't have to compare with the best of the world, but you could compare yourself with your buddies on on in your on your home site. You could compare within your country. You could compare with other people who flew a B wing, and and um, it was and then with GPS, it was it became simple. It was accessible, and then we thought, well, this this is probably the not the future, but but the future that may appeal for the for for the majority of the pilots. So it was a strategic decision to say we stop building CCC wings or competition wings, what, however they were called at that time. Um, I mean, I, I asked in my local club, do you know who's the German champion, who's the world champion? And they never knew. And actually, at the last Nova Pilots team meeting, um, we were in Slovenia, and there were like 75, 80 people. I asked the same question again, and honestly, nobody knew. <laughs> It's, yeah, it's a very I mean, we, it's we, a, it's not it's a very isolated end of the sport, isn't it? Yeah, I'm 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 not negative about it. Yeah. Um it's 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 just a matter of fact that as the majority of the people just don't care at all. And 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 we we also became aware of like like myself without being a top pilot but becoming aware that that I can fly a longer distance with a lower class wing that this is probably the case for for several people. And then we said, okay, so let's have a, a pilot's team which is completely different from, from the typical competition team. I, I mean, the competition team is basically, at that time it was, you buy the best pilots and then try to win. And, and you give them money, and, and Nova was really spending money on, 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 on comps in the old days. But then we said, a lot of the paragliding stuff is, is not so much about winning and, and being, being the hero and being better than others, but it's, a lot of it is also, I mean, everybody's flying by himself. A major part for, I think, is meeting the other guys and having a beer after you've flown. It's, I think, it's a highly social thing. Also, when you're traveling with a paraglider, I've been just to been to Sicily for a week with some friends, and we got in touch with some local people, with Dario and and um, and Marco Busetta. And I mean, you go there, and you change immediately from being a tourist into one of us, hmm. and you're accepted. And that's that's the great thing about paragliding. So. We decided we want to do something which focuses more on, first of all, cross-country flying, and second, also like having a, a social component. Like if you want to become a Nova team pilot, you can be the best pilot in the world. But if you're an asshole, um, we wouldn't take you. Hmm. So we, we try to also have people who are simply nice chaps um, hmm. and, 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 and also who are happy to share the experience, not not like having a, a mirror, mirrored sunglasses and be unbelievably cool. But, but if you ask them a question, they tell you, come on, go away and leave me, leave me alone. That's exactly what we don't want to have. We want to have like, like friendly people who willingly share the experience. And then at the same time, the performance of the, of the lower class wings became so good. And, and that it, it happened all together. But it was definitely also, let's say, in, in looking at from, from a more, from a wider perspective, like like 15 years ago, if you were not flying a high aspect ratio wing, you couldn't be cool. If you want to be cool, you had to have a hot thing and 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 flying flying like a one of one of one of these zeppelins, like like a, like an ion today, which is performing fantastic. But it, at that time, it was just not cool. If you were flying a mambo or mentor, you were not cool in the early mm -hmm. days. Mm -hmm. But today, if I land to close to somebody with a with an Enzo Zeno, something like this. They fully accept me um, because they know I might have covered a longer distance than they they did, mm. and and that's um, in a sense you guys made you know flying the lower class wings cool again. You're not cool again. We want to make it cool. No, but you, but yeah, you made it cool. Not cool again, yeah. but you, you made it yeah. cool. It was suddenly, you know, I, I think, I think a lot of people went, well, wait a minute, why am I flying this high aspect, hard to handle glider if I can just fly a mentor and go three hundred? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it, it was definitely also um, a strategic decision to do this because we were, um, I mean, if if I look at at the, the Germany. DHV, I think they 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 issue every year like two thousand new licenses. So we have two thousand people coming into our sport, but the number of wings sold basically stays flat. Yep. So that means the same number of people who get into it also get out of it. Yep. And the question is, why do they get out of it? Um, I mean, maybe 
I mean, things like family, career, uh, stuff like this. But I think also that that in the past, at least, there were definitely. I, I know a couple of people who had negative experiences, found themselves being in in real shit and having no clue why it happened, and being that totally exposed and have experienced two or three times, or also having an accident, and just knowing, well, this this is crap. But definitely. Some of them were wings that were were way too hot for them, mm. and and but to to be cool you had to have it. So we we hoped that we could make the whole paragliding being more down to earth and and more normal for normal people. Also by 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 being, have, having the full acceptance of of flying whatever you want. I mean, Robert Chala, another one of our team pilots, he, he flew a, a two hundred kilometer triangle with a Prion three. It's it's a it's an instruction wing, and he and he's I mean he's a great pilot, but um, on a good day, a, a good pilot can can fly bloody far without having a hot wing. And what would you say to the argument? And and I you know I I know I'm not a wing designer, and I I, I don't believe you are either. You're more on the, the the PR side of things. But the one argument I hear a lot is that you know if a company's not building open class glide sorry, CCC gliders these days, uh, then, you know, the, the, the argument is that, you know, the ozones and the gins, you know, the, because they're building, uh, comp wings that that technology gets passed down through the brand, you know, so that starts showing up in the, the B's and the C's, um, you know, most brands don't make comp wings. So I, I don't know how much validity that has but you know clearly that doesn't seem to have affected nova at all i mean in, in other words they're not really missing out on sales uh, very much because i think everybody knows the economics of selling comp gliders it doesn't really it, it doesn't make any sense for a manufacturer it's more for the fame and it's more for that and what i hear is that it's more for that kind of you know, if we if we press it at that end, that it's going to come down through the rest of the gliders and make them faster, better, safer. Well, um, if 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 you if you look at the Formula One, that's what they also say. I I don't have the impression that that there is uh, a huge performance benefit that that the wings from 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 ozone or or Nibioke or Jin, to name the mo three most important in in, in CCC. Um, that their lower class wings are reasonably better than, let's say, Skywalks and Novas and and swings. Mm. Um, so, if there is some miraculous technology in it, it to me it doesn't show. Yeah, it just um, doesn't doesn't show in the statistics, I guess, does it? Yeah, um, and of, of course, from the marketing standpoint, if if I was Ozone, I would do the same for sure. I mean, they were they would be stupid if they didn't do it. Honestly, I, I can tell you that that I, I see certain differences um, that are in favor of them. Ozone at the moment and 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 Jin, they have the, obviously the two fastest and still somehow controllable wings. They do the business, and everybody else. I, I don't know who said it, but somebody once told me building comp wings is actually like like masturbating for the designer <laughs> <laughs> because you have. If if you have the best wing, then everybody buys yours. And if you don't have the best wing, you actually have to pay people to fly it. Yeah. And um and it's it's basically for the eager of the designer to do something like it. Mm -hmm. And 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 I think the higher category wing you have, the, the the more accurate everything has to be because all the tolerance are much smaller. And um and we can say on the other side, we have two full time designers and we have three full time test pilots. And and we spent all the energy that we have into making our E and B and E and A and also like on the sector E and C wings or Triton to make these wings excellent wings in their category. And they 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 don't spend their bloody time on on making a product which which is masturbating for the designer. And mm -hmm. that's why our wings are better. That's that's our marketing story that we could tell. Um, so, and I mean I think I I, I saw. Um... I saw t statistics that somebody had put together a few years back on 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 every every bit of gear that people can buy, and like you said, the attrition rate seems to be keeping up with the people coming into the sport. So you know, it, every year it's about the same. So all these companies are fighting for the same piece of the pie, and you know, by far, I mean it's it's a it's huge. The numbers of B and C wings is is where you make your money. 
I mean, you're making it there. You're not making it in the D's and the comp wings. I, I think ozone makes money on. No, I'm sorry, the yeah. ozone's definitely making it on the Zeno, but yeah, definitely. I mean, if you look at the PMA statistics, I think it's it's 45 percent of all wings sold are E and B wings. Yeah, uh, right. and and another 25 E and A, and and then C, and then eventually you have the comp wings, and then like specials like mini wings and other crazy uh, acro stuff and stuff like that. Mm. But but definitely, I mean. Um, we we focus on on the on the Volkswagen Golf category in in paragliding. Mm, mm. Try to make this category as as good as we can. So tell tell me more about the Nova team. How do you how do people get on it? How many do you have on it? Are they are these paid? Are they paid positions? Or are they just gear uh, or just partially gear? How does it work? Yeah, they if, all if get you can talk fortune. about it. Yeah, they they all get unbelievably a lot of money and get ten ten wings free for per year. No, that's just kidding. Um, <laughs> I, was, I was just about to pass out. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's. Um, I think at the moment we are worldwide, um, like ninety pilots or something like it. You can you can see it on on, on our website. Um, mm. It's a pilots team, but something like 90, 90 pilots. And there's always, I mean, some especially if we have the young ones. Um, some of them are suddenly more attracted to, to acro others start to fly, fly comp. I mean, uh, some of these really, really well-known pilots started with us, like, like, um, Paul Guschelbauer used to be a Nova team pilot. Aaron Dorogati was a Nova team pilot when he was young. Then, uh, some of the, the young English chaps have been with us. Um, Simon Oberauner, he was with us. So we, we've, we've had some young guys who, proceeded very quickly and then said okay we, we, we want to fly in a, in a category that you don't make mm. and and if they fully focus on this and and actually decide to to make a try to make a living out of it then it's it's okay but the good thing is we're we're, we're still in touch with them and we're still friends with them mm. and um because I, I think a lot of i mean you shouldn't be too narrow-minded sometimes people are but but we try to be rather open and just be as i said try to be nice chaps mm -hmm. so if people apply for for team pilot it's i mean in the in the beginning we didn't know how it would work so what we did in, in the early days we it was only limited to german-speaking countries and i was approaching people that i knew from the online contests who were already flying mentors or mambus successfully and and pretty long distances and then i asked them oh we have an idea and this this is our vision what do you think of this net? Yeah, yeah, exactly. This is what I'm already doing. Cool. Yeah. And I like Nova. And, and I think everybody that I asked willingly joined the team because it, it was like, they had the same idea that we had. So it started with the 15, 20 pilots in the first year. I think it's now since it's 12 years old, the pilots team, uh, but it started in, 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 a, in a, on, on a very small scale. And, and, and it was just, growing organically and it was not the case that 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 the management at nova decided oh yeah let's spend a fortune on this it was rather giving it a try and see how it would work and um yeah and then we realized it works and then we we made the international team opened it up and then um added the juniors who unfortunately don't stay juniors forever <laughs> So now that's, I mean, that's, this is like a, co a constant change there, definitely. And, and let's, um, let's talk about that real, real briefly, Till. The, the junior, juniors team is, I think, just so smart and, and something we need really worldwide because we just don't have enough young people getting into the sport, right? I mean, to, to, to sustain paragliding, we need more young people getting into it. And uh, so tell me about the juniors team. Yeah, I mean, it was basically the the, the same idea. If, if 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 you apply as a as a team pilot, um, first you mostly it starts with an email, and then I ask them, so why do you apply? Um, why do you apply at Nova in particular? In particular, and it's often that people just think, oh, I would like to be a team pilot, and then you realize, like a job application, that they don't really look at what your team or what your brand stands for. They just, I mean, I've also re received. Uh, applications where they forgot to to change the names at hey at at, at skywalk i want to become a team pilot which, which is not the best best start for a positive answer um 
but but many of them who actually apply for the Nova Pilots team have met other team pilots and 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 they are pretty pretty much aware of of our way of doing things which as, as you say um i think we're pretty different from most of the others at least we're the, we were the first ones to focus on cross country flying and and absolutely and strategically ignore the comp world and um so the first first contact is with an email and then then i i, I check how yeah it's, it's a lot of guts feeling um, and then we send them the team vision, which which explains pretty detailed of of what we have in mind. It also explains that being a team pilot is not only taking; that it also means giving. Um, that we expect them to to have rather good communication skills and 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 willingly write occasionally something for the team blog, um, give feedback on the wings. Yeah, and and you asked about uh, do they get money or something. No, we have we have a system. Um, we have A and B pilots. Everybody pay, pays for his wing, and everybody owns his own wing. So it's it's Nova never sells directly to end consumers. It's always schools and, and distributors, with the exception of the team pilots. Hmm. And and we consider them to be more like brand ambassadors, so that in the end they should help our um, partners to to sell more wings. Then we have the system of A and B pilots. The A pilots are the ones that that simply do great flying in terms of results um, but you can also become an a pilot by contributing to the team whatever it may mean it can be doing videos it can be delivering great content that we can use on facebook uh, it can also be that you are the one who organized the next team meeting it's mostly that that we, we try to go to different locations it's always the first weekend in october because then the xc flying season is over and and people people are down to earth again and and not <laughs> not <laughs> i i remember when christian pichler he stopped flying unfortunately meanwhile um he was leading in in the sports sports class on x contest and i was talking to him some some time in early september like, christian how's life ah i'm stressed i'm so completely stressed you know christian he he runs uh, he owns a company he's he's a whole wholesaler for for wood and and wooden stuff like um like floor and and, mm. and and this big company, I think that he employs more than a hundred people. So running a company with a hundred people and being an, an ambitious paraglider often doesn't go together too well. And he, you know, now I'm leading. Now I want to win. But you know, then I see huh, weather forecast good. Huh, so somebody might 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 long <laughs> flight. And then defending I, I his like, defending yeah. his position. <laughs> I mean, That's the downside you, of X contest yeah, for sure. Yeah. When once you lead, do you really want to win? And I'm looking so much forward to end of September. Then everything is over. Oh, and he was completely stressed. So, um, <laughs> I mean, so coming coming back, how to become a team pilot? You can you can do you can achieve great results, but you can also do videos, do some writing, sell articles, place photographs in magazines, uh, having your own website, doing videos, uh, or just be like a, a super nice guy, kind of a respected, not not even local hero. But somebody who who enjoys a positive reputation as a as a good pilot, but also as a reasonable pilot. Mm. We don't want any daredevils. Actually, mm. I'm I'm actively encouraging all our team pilots if they go XC and and they feel it's turbulent and they decide to land. I encourage them to land and say, "I found it was too bumpy. I was scared. I landed," because I, be we, we, we about think. It. They, yeah, just be honest. And I mean, what's the use of being a hero, but who is who is doing things that are kind of crazy? Mm. It and, only um, takes once. Yeah, and 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 I, I, I think it's also that we have a, like a clear rule. It's always more important if if you see somebody who, who throws his reserve. I expect our team pilots to be the first ones to land and to go there and 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 help, mm. and forget about the two hundred or three hundred kilometer triangle. Um, help the others because that's what I would hope that somebody else does. So we 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 we, we put a lot of emphasis on per positive personality in the largest sense. Hmm. Yeah, that's and that's um, great. and then when when I have the feeling that they might fit, they get a pretty long application form that they have to fill in, where they actually have to reflect about their their own flying and about what we expect and whether they fit with Nova. And we've had in the past that that people said, you know what. I thought about it. Luckily, I'm in a position that I don't need to 
I'm not look, actively looking for a cheaper wing. I think I rather prefer to buy the wing that I think is the, the, the nicest for me in that se season. And I don't want to sell myself to any other brand. And like, like, in, I mean, we, we don't have contracts. Everything is based on, on trust and, and it's, it's, it's easy going. I highly respect people who say, well, I don't want a cheaper wing. I prefer to buy whatever I think is, is the nicest. And, and that's quite cool actually. Yeah, for sure. Is it, it, is it possible these days, you know, I think, you know, the, the kind of like kite surfing, the days of, of, you know, huge contracts and money and winning, you know, and winnings, that's obviously all gone. Um, but is there, you know, you mentioned Aaron and Paul who have carved out, you know, pretty nice living through sponsorship, through Red Bull and that kind of thing. But, you know, is it, is it possible as a, as a pilot to, you know, create a life from flying with Nova or is it, mo you know, the team pilots are, it's, it's, uh, you know, you, you get some, you get some gear and you've still got to figure out a way to live. None, none of our, our team pilots is, is, um, making anything which might be even close to make a living it no yeah. no everybody has a has a, a normal job or is, is still studying or something like it mm. but um and i think in in general it's oh, if if somebody asked me I, I want to make a living in the world of paragliding well as a as a let's say freelance pilot it's really difficult yeah and um and but that's 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 the same also in, in mountaineering and, and expedition stuff generally um, but there, at least, the, the whole industry is bigger, and there's there's, there's simply more money. Um, I mean, the paragliding industry it's it's, it's worldwide co compared to other industries. It's ridiculous. I mean, we're we're a little freak show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and comp I mean, just looking at at let's say North Face. I don't know what the turnover is. I think it's like something like like two billion dollars or two and a half billion dollars. Um, I don't know how big the paragliding industry is overall, but it's definitely not that big. Yeah. All so, total. so be, yeah, I think Kriegel is probably the only one who, who, who can live reasonably from being a hero. And then already for Aaron and, and Paul, uh, I think they're not getting rich. No, they get in also looking at my, at my other work as a, as a communication agent for, for, for companies from the outdoor industry. These guys, might start making a living when they have become so well known that the people from outside the paragliding industry get interested in them. Yeah, exactly. So, I think within paragliding, it's it's nearly impossible. Exactly, yeah. and 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 a lot of like Theo de Blick, he he does these great videos, and if if you get interested, interesting to let, let's say the automotive industry that they they look for somebody who can do some crazy stuff or is partnering with you, then money is involved, but. But working, uh, living, trying to make a living within the paragliding industry as a as a sponsored athlete, it's yeah. You have, to, I mean, you have to be extremely good, but as a pilot, but at the same time, be extremely good in marketing yourself. Yeah, like a Jean Baptiste Chandelier, I think. You know, maybe, exactly. Yeah, yeah Jean Baptiste is a, a, a very good example. Yeah. Um, and also, if you look at his 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 uh, number of followers on on, on Facebook or on, on YouTube. I mean, he simply does great stuff, but the, these big numbers come from people who do not fly themselves. Yeah, these are people who 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 watch uh, Red Bull TV and get appealed by all kind of adrenaline, almost self suicidal stuff. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I see Red Bull with with um, I mean, the Exiles is fantastic, but honestly, if 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 I see at what conditions you guys fly there, ah, uh, it's it's. To me, it's sometimes insane. I mean, I, yeah, I'm, I'm doing it because I edge. like flying. Yeah. It, it's definitely on the edge, and and I think it's I I highly admire Michael Gebert when he said the last time, okay, we've come to a point where I don't want to do it anymore, and and I withdraw, and that that, that takes a lot of courage also to say this. Yeah, that was a that was the day that Tom crashed, and uh, he and I were in the exact same spot. Michael was just behind us, and I mean, it was just madness, and, and it it had been madness. You know, Michael Vichy is through through his reserve the day before. I mean, we were just fighting so much wind, and it's you know that's yeah. the kind of stuff that's really hard to see from the live tracking. You know, we were just just constantly, you know, all day uh, just battling these horrific conditions, and it was. Uh, yeah, that no, I, I had he and I had to talk about that this year down in Brazil. I really admired him for that as well. And and so becoming a professional pilot, um, 
I think you have better chances to work as a test pilot mm. um, because that's what what the manufacturers need. And and looking at, for example, Mario Eder, who has been over for long, has been away and then came back. And Mario, I think, is very good at at um, also finding the right trim for wing. And that's that's a very special skill. Uh, it's also looking at Formula One. You know, there, there's drivers who never win a race, but as a test driver, they they are unbelievably important. And to the manufacturers, you need these guys. Mm-hmm. And there there are some test pilots who are good at at doing or repeating like almost like a machine. They they certification flights and all the incidents that you have to create. And but then there are guys like Mario who are very good at at actually making the wing suitable for what it is designed for and and if, if you're good at that you definitely have a better chance to make a living from from paragliding than becoming a, a star like 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 kriegel till what do you see in you know you've been following this you, you really helped create it the the nova team and you've been following these kids the juniors and the and the international team pilots for years now um what do you see that separates those that you know, get on the team and just keep this kind of skyrocket uh, learning and they just keep getting better and better and better. And, you know, they just keep achieving more versus the ones that maybe drop off or leave or, you know, leave the sport maybe. But, you know, are are you, do you see a kind of a, uh, do you see a a common thread there? Generally, I think it is with paragliding, like with every other not only sport, but with every other skill, may it be painting, singing, uh, writing, whatever. Um, you have a certain amount of talent and you you can improve by practicing. And there are definitely people who have an unbelievable talent. And and they, they yeah, like people say, Kriegel the Eagle. I mean, he's, he's basically a bird accidentally born in form of a human being. He's, he, he's just so much better. And also, like, we have, we have a couple of pilots who who are outstanding. Not only Bernie Pessel, I mean, but Bernie is a good example. I asked him, Bernie, if you want to fly long, that means you have to fly fast and stay in the air. And and Bernie, first of all, he he's just unbelievable in finding the right moment when he can launch. He he's so often he's the first, but somehow he never never is too early. Mm. So he launches and and then finds a the thermal and goes up. And then he's extremely good at thermaling, like he's super efficient. Like like he just knows where where's the core and where do you get up as as fast as possible. And then he has sometimes these, yeah, these magic lines like Kriegel flies them. You look at his track and he's just not thermaling. He's just flying and he do, doesn't lose altitude. And I asked him, how do you decide which line you fly? And he said, oh, you just look around and I fly. And said, but 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 how do you make a decision? And, and he said. Honestly, I don't know. I just fly, yeah. and then I think, "Come on, there must be some secret." He, he's, 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 yeah, it's, it's. He, he can't explain himself, hmm. and 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 we have a couple of other people, like people like like Chris Bessai, who's who's um, I mean, he joined as a junior, and um, I think he was he had just turned sixteen, but he had already been flying five years when he joined the team. Also living living at 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 the at the landing and yeah growing up with paragliders and um, funnily he always stayed he, he was never too much appealed into competition flying but always um, I think the highest wing that he ever flew was was a factor so ENC wing he's a super smart guy also in IT he does the Nova website and I mean he's he's, he's really super intelligent and he doesn't fly that much anymore but if he goes flying he easily does a two hundred fifty kilometer triangle. And mm, and, and he's also one of the one one of these guys like like when I fly want to fly long if 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 I if I try to be fast then I bump out if I fly to if I try to fly safe I'm slow <laughs> so and, and 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 I see these young kids just rocketing towards towards me passing me and and I think oh okay that, maybe I should take that terminal just be safe be high. And they just fly and fly and fly, and they they go to a spot where it's like they they can see the elevator where it goes up, and I just don't see it, mm-hmm. and they are just just better. <laughs> and it's it's it, I mean isn't it's, it? yeah, that people are they are super talented. I'm not. I have to accept it, but it's but it's okay. That's the way it is. 
Yeah, that's and we have to know where we fit, isn't it? I think that's one of the, the the greatest ways to to be safe is to just know your abilities and know where you are and 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 try to try as hard as you can to remove the ego from it, uh, which in things like the Xops is pretty hard to do, but. Till I want to be mindful of your time. I, I know it's getting late, your side of the world, and you got to get on the Autobahn and go to Finland. So I've got one more one more question for you. You mentioned right in the early part of the show that you know you've been flying since '86. Uh, I'm doing my math correctly. That's a lot of years, and uh, and you've never had an accident. Can you tell us what you attribute that to? Because I imagine that's um, probably changed over the years. You know, I'm I'm sure you weren't always conservative and smart. None of us are. Uh, yes, no, no. I, I would say generally as a personality, I'm more on the cautious side, hmm. um, which may sound, I mean, you know, it. if you tell people you're a paragliding pilot, then they always say, oh, you are, you are brave, you're courageous, which I think being, being extremely courageous or, or, or willing to, 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 to risk something is is not sometimes not too favorable to do it for a long time being cautious or at least having respect helps a lot and so i I was always more on the cautious side also in the beginning i I was smart enough to know it is a dangerous thing and also like coming from from a background as a as a as a climber or mountaineer you you are very much aware of of dangers like people dying in avalanches and stuff like that or just falling i mean that time there there were there were hardly any bolts you had to, you had to do all the bee laying by yourself like with rocks and stoppers and later camelots and so i i was always very cautious so that's one reason the second reason i think is at least in germany i have the impression that there are several schools who do not have the the target to turn a paragliding beginner into a self-relying pilot. Because, I mean, as a teacher, you're a good teacher if you make yourself redundant. Mm. Then you're the best teacher because then then you've passed on your knowledge, your experience. But in terms of paragliding, there are schools who who think if if I if I do my job too well, I will I will lose a customer. And and they don't really teach be- people to become self-responsible. And I, I know quite a few people who, who, who passed their license and then suddenly now, now I'm a pilot and nobody else is telling me what to do. Like during your instruction, your, your teacher is a God. I mean, he tells the conditions are good, go. And you trust, I mean, you, basically mm-hmm. you, you give him your life. Mm-hmm. And then suddenly you're standing at, at the takeoff and there's nobody who tells you, hmm, it's good or it's not so good, and you stand there and 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 you're wondering, is it good? Is it not good? And and I think a lot of lot of schools don't do this. And the way we started, I mean, I, I never had some kind of instruction. I always from the from day zero, I decided what I'm doing, and I'm very good at saying no, and 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 I'm I'm, I'm very good at making decisions. And I mean, last year I I was I was flying in this Dolomiti Superfly. Which is like uh, it's like like mini X Alps, and um, I was looking at some of these people when they were flying. Same as, same as you said, I think. Come on, guys. I mean, it was end of June, beginning uh, end of May, beginning of June. So every day I had double digit climb rates, and almost every day there were thunderstorms. Hmm. And like I land, if I see a thunderstorms building up, I, I land immediately. I don't want to come to a point where I have to fight to get down. And, and, and I saw people flying in conditions where I said, mm, come on. And in particular, as I mean, you're not getting rich. You're, not, you're hardly getting, I mean, even if you get famous, you, you get famous in, 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 in the microcosmos of paragliding. Um, who cares? Yeah, who, who, who in the world cares? Nobody. And, and, and then I say, that's, that's not worth it. And, and now also, like age matters a lot. Um, I've definitely become even more cautious than, than, than I ever was. And I've, I've seen too many accidents and I've lost too many friends. Um, so at the moment I'm flying a phantom, which is super low B in terms of safety. And it just, you know, you know, I'm, I'm more relaxed with that. Mm. And, um, yeah, but, but, but still I'm almost world champion and having fun. Ah. <laughs> 
yes. <laughs> that was an awesome exclamation point. Oh, that's great. I, I, I love it. Um, okay. I, we should just end there because that was rad and that's a perfect ending, <laughs> but you, you brought up something that I got to ask about because this is actually starting to bother me a bit with the, as I'm hearing this a lot also from our guests, is there any, this is a monumental task, but you know, so much, okay, you could be an Appy school or a Uspa school, whatever, you know, there's a million of them, yeah, but yeah. it's so dependent on that person, you know, who you go to, or are you a kinetic, it, it, it's totally dependent on how you learn as a person, but also who you go to for the school. And like you just said, you know, you've, you've got this person that's a God and you've got them on the radio and they're telling you what to do. And then it's done. You get your certification exactly. and it's done and you have no idea what you don't know. And some of us get lucky and make it through that period and some don't. And, and, uh, I mean, I'm finding it, it's really frustrating depending on where you go. And when you're, when you're just learning, you have no idea where to go. Um, you know, you might go because you see it outside your window and, you know, if you're in Europe, you see people flying all the time, but here you, you really te tend to have to travel a long ways and you go to somewhere and there's a, and you you know, there's a school and you take the, you take the course and then you're cut free. But that course yep. is so dependent on, you know, what kind of weather you got that week, you know, what the mood was with the instructor, you know, it just goes on and on and on. Is there any way, or is there any push for that to change, to kind of standardize this? Because, you know, if you go to one site, you might become a really good ground handler, which I think is just paramount in, in staying safe. And you go to another site and they're lobbing you off a hill, you're never going to get to ground handle. You know, it's just, it doesn't work there. And so unless yeah, that, yeah. unless that instructor really impresses on you that ground handling is important, you're not going to do it. Yep. I agree. Now I have, have no idea of, of what to do and how to achieve it. Um, I, I think the, the only way is actually like when the authorities, let's say DHV or in our, in our in Germany, when they have these courses where, where they, where instructors become instructors, um, that they have to be definitely much more looking into their, let's say, psychological skills mm. in terms, not focus much more on this. I mean, it's 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 very hard. How can you say you you are not suitable to become an instructor? It's it's. I, I mean, there's nothing you can measure. You you can see how somebody's yeah. flying, whether he can he can master his, his wings in all kinds of conditions, whether he 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 he's landing on the spot and stuff like this. But um, it's it's um, it's it's a very delicate topic. But mm. then again, if I look at at the how to become a mountain guide, I was just I thinking think, the same thing. I mean, if you you know my friends that are IFMGA guides, they are there isn't one of them that's kind of weak. They're all amazing. I mean, they they have exactly. they have gone through thirty thousand dollars worth of instruction. It's taken them years and years and years. They're super dedicated. I mean, if you go on an avalanche safety course, you know it's going to be good. You know yeah, it's exactly. going to be taught by amazing people who are super passionate about it. And I, I guess maybe the difference is there is you know you know you can make a living being a guide. Like I don't know. I I, I it's it's uh yeah it's not as rigorous like you said. It is sensitive, but it it needs to be as rigorous in paragliding. I mean, you need to know that you're going to a great instructor. Exactly. Um, I think that should be much much stricter. Mm. Um, one thing is like to to make this. I mean, you have to do some kind of test flying uh, when you when you when you want to be allowed to to do the instruction courses but then actually allowing somebody to be an instructor that should be much much stricter that that i think is the, is the only way how to do it and maybe these the 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 associations should look much closer into what what the mountain guides are doing because it's the same here the the young mountain uh, younger younger generation of mountain guides i would say there's hardly anybody who is not they are, they're all excellent mountaineers and climbers and skiers, but there's also, there's nobody anymore who's kind of a, of a freaky personality. Mm. They are, they are really good and, and they are really mentally very strong and, and, and they, all of them do a, a good to excellent job, which I would not say is the case with, with the average paragliding instructor in the Alps. 
Definitely not. And not, and not anywhere that I've been. I, I think it really depends. I mean, there, there are great ones out there. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I'll be talking to F- Fabian Blanco with Flyo here next week on the podcast. who's just terrific. But I, I, I think it's almost one of these things where we need more regulation, which everybody hates, but it's almost the only answer is to have, you know, like the IFMGA stuff, you know, that you have to go through so many different loops and courses. And like you said, in psychology, they're grading you on, on how you're, you're, you're getting up and it's kind of silent behind the scenes. And then they, they really tell you how well you did and it can be hard to stomach. And, um, you know, I, I think it, it has to be something like that. Like I, I know, and I know there are certain countries that do this, but you know, like a, a certain amount of SIVs that you have to have before you can even go XC, you know, this stuff like that. I just don't see a way around that. I mean, it, if we want to make it safe, which it isn't. Yeah. 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 Definitely. No, but it's, 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 the, the, the key thing is to actually teach people to clearly identify their, their, their level of flying and then make them be able to fly in conditions that they, they can fully handle, mm. that it never gets out of control. I, I wouldn't, wouldn't say, I mean, I'm, 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 a, I'm a strong believer in, of, of SIVs, definitely. But if, if you just want to do some recreational flying, like where, where I live, a couple of years ago, there was a mountain which is now banned for for launch. But um, every time I went there, it's it's a hike and fly, five hundred meters altitude gain, so nothing nothing spectacular. And every time I went up there, there were three retired guys sitting there, and they had it was a couple of years ago. They all had this um, the peak, you know, this this first lightweight mm-hmm. wing ever, mm-hmm. and and sometimes they would even share a bottle of wine. And I said, hey, come on, guys, you're, you're drinking. And I said, well, but why, why are not flying conditions are perfect? And he said, you know what? We're too old. For us, it's recreation. <laughs> we wait until there's no more thermals. Then, then we gently fly down. Oh, we have great. any ambitions at all, and we just want to see the beautiful landscape. We want to sit here and enjoy ourselves and even have a wine together and then fly down. <laughs> um, I love it. I mean, of course, if there's an incident, maybe there, there, luckily there, there never obviously was one, but... Um, I would I wouldn't say that you have to force people into SIVs. You're right. You're um, right. Yeah, that probably is extreme. But some, you know, some some kind of like a checkbox system, you know, that you yeah, yeah. that you have to kind of work through to in order to do certain things where you're not just so reliant on you know, maybe hopefully you're at a launch like Annecy and there's plenty of other pilots around who can help you out when you're when you're learning, but you know, a lot of the places we fly here at home, there it's you. You know, and you're just when you're when you're learning, it can be pretty scary. Yeah, yeah, and 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 one other thing that might help is also like, uh, especially in the Alps, there's there's lots of clubs, and I mm. think on on club level that might might be, how would you say, like a good pool where people can help each other after they have finished their 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 instruction, mm. and and it's also like, yeah, helping each other learning from each other that's also like we we it will be end of april we will have a a new competition format is called the nova xc team challenge and we will have 25 team pilots but not only exclusively nova team pilots that will form teams with four pilots who yeah are get into into one small five person team by kind of some kind of lottery so people don't know who they will fly with and and they should fly together and learn from each other, fly with radio and the team pilot, uh, the, 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 the team leader is actually there to help them. And ideally they fly together. And, um, and we put a strong focus on that fun and learning thing and, and less on, on winning. Mm. And that's going to be pretty interesting. And, and it's, and it's XC flying. So it's not typical comp flying. The, the team decides where they go and, and what they plan. And then they try to fly together. And, and it's, it's going to be really interesting how it works because Hermann Klein, who is like the race director, he did this on a, on a club level and said it was a big success. Mm. And we were wondering, hmm, will people like it? It's, it's different from everything else. And does that w- flying in five people gaggles together, will it work? We're having different level of skills. And, but the good thing is um, it's already booked out. And if you want to apply now, you're on the waiting list and, and, considering that it's the first time that we do it and nobody knows how it works at least it sounds appealing hmm. 
That's great. So it's, That's an awesome idea. I love it. And I, I, it, there seems to actually be kind of a shift towards that. You know, one of the guests I had on recently, Marco, um, just ran a race kind of like that down in Valle. So instead of like a race to goal, it was just we start here and we try to get back here. So it was it was encouraging triangles, but it was basically it, the, the the scoring system was a combination of X contest and speed and aspect ratio so not even e and yep. b or c or d but aspect ratio uh in terms of uh how how they figured out the uh, what i was trying to say not not the points but the handicap and and then you were encouraged to just you basically won if you chose the right thing to do that day and went really big yeah. and it was it you know so it was encouraging people to not go into dicey places, not have to fly in the lee all the time like you do on a task. And, uh, and you know, from all reports, I wasn't in it, but all reports, it was just a blast. And, it, you know, and, and it's really, it was geared to really find out who's the best XC pilot. You know, in that kind of yeah. format, Kriegel would definitely win. <laughs> but but uh, he but, would always win. <laughs> yeah, he always won everything. But you know, it was it, 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 I, and I think there's a real push that way. But it was also real supportive and a great learning environment. And I I, I think that's that's a yeah a great way forward. Well, congratulations on on doing. That. I think that's a great idea. Yeah, we 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 have the same handicap. Like like uh, we have three. Uh, it's maximum is E and C, so no D and no C C wings, and we also have a handicap on on the. Um, aspect ratio so we have four aspect ratio categories mm. um so we we picked up some of the ideas but then again we we try to encourage a lot this this um this this the the, the team idea like people flying together having it planning together yeah mm. that's great creating creating new teams it's going to be interesting to see how it works i i i, I mean i hope we're lucky with the weather and but but so far i'm i'm pretty positive but we can we 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 will see um, beginning of May, so it's it's going to be twenty seventh of April to first of May in Greifenburg. So oh, perfect spot to do it. Yeah, that's a great site. Well, I'll, I'll check back in with you on that. Till, thank you so much. I'm gonna let you get on the road. I really appreciate this. Uh, lots of great info there, and uh, best of luck to you. And uh, can't wait to spin around in the sky, doing the absurd thing that we do one of these days. Yes. Thanks a lot. Thanks for the for the interview. And I think actually we've we've met on on the X Alps uh, three years ago because you were passing our house and I was standing in road and giving you some some apple juice. Ah, no way. That's right. Of course, uh, of near, course. Near, near, oh, near that was so when, good. That was so good. I just from, downed from it. Kampenwand, uh, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. I didn't. So. I did not put that together. That's I. I now for sure. I remember that very, very vividly. Yeah, that was. Oh, that was good, man. <laughs> thank you for that. Yeah, it's a small world. And it's a nice world. <laughs> it is a nice world. Till, thank you very much. Thanks, Kevin, and um, hopefully see you soon. See you soon. I hope you enjoyed that. Really cool to sit down with these folks that have been in the sport since the very beginning and get their take. Hope you learned a lot from it. And if you are getting something from the show, uh, please support us. You're, you can support us in a number of different ways. It doesn't have to be financial, although all we've ever asked for is a buck a show, so you can kind of treat it like a magazine subscription. You can support us through cloudbasedmayhem.com. You can see the uh, links there to support us on a one-off donation through PayPal or as a kind of a set it and forget it and be rewarded for doing so through patreon.com forward slash cloud based mayhem. But you can also just share the show, talk about it with your friends on the way up to launch, uh, tell the school, share it with your club. You know, there's a lot of different ways to uh, get the word out there. This is all about just spreading knowledge, but your support goes a long ways. As you can imagine, this takes a lot of time and a lot of money and, uh, but it's fun. We're going to keep doing it and we really appreciate your support and we'll see you on the next show. Cheers. Cheers.